Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for Conversations with CKG. Our topic this evening is the effects of school violence on teen mental health. My name is Sarah Jane Scoble, and I'm the Director of Mental Health Education at the Cameron Gallagher Foundation. Conversations with CKG is our discussion series that seeks to turn the whispered, hidden conversations about mental health into open, supportive, and educational dialogue. Um, our executive director, Grace Gallagher, is joining us this evening to run the Q&A during our discussion. Um, you'll see that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we just ask that you use this to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and we'll get to those questions throughout the conversation, and then we'll also save some time at the end of the evening um, for any additional questions. Keep an eye out for an email in the coming days containing resources that we discussed tonight, um, as well as a link to a recording of this conversation. Um, and the recording will also be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. We are joined this evening by our guest expert, Carla Allen, who is the Coordinator of Counseling Services for Hanover County Public Schools and serves as an adjunct professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. Carla, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us this evening. Wow, oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to be here with you tonight. Well, we are so glad that you're here. So we can get right into our conversation. Um, as I said, you know, tonight we're talking about school violence and how that impacts the mental health of our teens. Um, and obviously, you know, some school districts have already started, others are getting ready to start their new school year. So I wanna talk first about some proactive approaches that caregivers can take. Um, you know, students are getting back into the school year. Some of them are still integrating back into in-person instruction. Um, they're gonna be going through active shooter drills. So what are some proactive approaches that caregivers can take um, as we start this school year, you know, before an event occurs or before they start to see any signs of fear? Right, so at uh, the beginning of the school year, um, your student will go through a lot of drills, as Sarah just said. At the beginning of the year, we are required to do a fire drill once a month. Um, more than likely, they'll do an active shooter drill. They'll, um, other drills we participate in throughout the year are uh, tornado drill. We do um, shelter in place drills. There's uh, multiple things that could happen throughout the year where a drill would be in place. And many times students have concerns around what that feels like and what that looks like. So as a parent, the best place to start, I think, is just having a conversation with your child about how they feel about that. I think it's really important not to give them false hope to say this would never happen at your school because as you see in the news every day, it can happen anywhere. Um, I had the, I went to a conference this summer and I went to two different sessions. One was um, from Lakeland, Florida, the counselor who lived through the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and was the counselor for the students at that high school. And then I also attended um, a session by the school counseling coordinator of Minneapolis Public Schools and Louisville, Kentucky Public Schools, where Brianna Taylor and George, George, Floyd, sorry, George Floyd murders occurred. So a lot of that conversation was about how do you bring students back into the building after a tragedy? And what do you do for students before the tragedy occurs? Um, Unfortunately, we have to have these conversations and there are people out there who do become experts in it because they do live through it in their buildings. The conversation, um, you know, the child may not bring it up. So how do you even start that conversation? My best conversations with my kids were all in the car when we were driving. So I'd ask them to take their um, AirPods out or their headphones and, um, or even just say, hey, let's go get a treat at Starbucks and just have a conversation. So asking those questions about, um, are you nervous about school? What are things that you're nervous about? Do you feel safe there? What does it feel like for you when you're uh, practicing an armed intruder drill? And I know as an adult, as, as I go through those, I'm really uneasy. And sometimes I get a little tearful um, as I'm watching the kids do an armed intruder drill because it's horrific that they're experiencing that. So as an adult, I, I get anxious around that. So I know students do as well. So asking them, um, what do you do during a drill? What does that drill look like? And what are some things that you're required to do? Just giving them the space to talk about that and then giving them the space to say, um, that does make me anxious. What can um, you do then 
to have that conversation, talk about why the drill is important, um, talk about what you would do if that were to happen, because again, to say that would not happen is not true any longer. Mm -hmm. And then do you have a trusted adult at school or a trusted friend that you could talk to about that? Many times that trusted adult is a school counselor, but sometimes it might be a coach or a teacher or sometimes it's a custodian. But do you have a safe person at the school to talk to about that? when the drill is occurring or after the drill that you feel comfortable to have the conversation. But to know that the drills are important, that they need to participate in the drill. I know sometimes the, we start thinking, oh, that makes them nervous. Let's have them not participate. But that just exacerbates the anxiety. If you say you don't have to participate in the drill, we have parents contact us all the time to say, my child needs to be excused from this. It makes them anxious or they need to know when a drill is occurring so they can be prepared. Well, the point of the drill is that it, it is unexpected. So um, exposing them to that is a good thing because it teaches them what to do. And then um, you'll get an email from your school saying you had a drill that day. They always send an email home. So just be on the lookout for that email. And when your child comes home, have that conversation. What did you do today during the drill? How did you feel about it? And just give them um, the space to talk about that. And again, Opening the conversation um, sometimes just does a lot of it. We don't think about that sometimes, but just asking them about that. One thing I do, uh, it's called a scaling question. Um, so you say, and we, we typically do it with numbers, but I always do it with my kids because they're in school. I would say, was it an A, B, C, D, or F? So A was the best, F was the worst, obviously. So when something would occur, I would say, how did that feel to you? What grade would you give that? And then they would assign a grade to it. So you can ask them, I do that for any event, just how was their day in general or how did you feel about this? Instead of them having to articulate a specific emotion, which is sometimes hard for kids, they can say that it was a C and you know that things were okay, but didn't go great. But if they tell you it was an F, you know you need to have more conversations about it. So just get creative in how you ask the questions. If you say, did you do okay today? Yes. How was everything? Fine. So you want to ask questions that you're not getting those one word responses. So mm -hmm. um, that way, if you do scaling, you can get a little bit more information and talk around that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's so important to, to let them know that their voice is being heard and that it matters. Um, and I love too that you mentioned the trusted adult. That's something that we really try to emphasize too, um, that you have that trusted adult that you can go to at school, um, You know, whether it is a school counselor or maybe it's a coach. Um, just that that person that you know that you can talk to. Um, so students do these drills, you know, um, and we talk about these things in hopes that they'll never happen. Um, but as you said, you know, school violence does occur and it can happen anywhere. Um, so what are some signs that caregivers could look for that might indicate that there is a concern or that their teen has a concern for their own safety at school? Um, I want to talk first of well, first of all, about the child who is anxious again, because um, full disclosure, I have a child who has mental health concerns and her started in middle school. Uh, we didn't really have a diagnosis at that point, but as she got older, we saw, we saw that coming out. And um, for her to feel safe in a building or to feel safe in any situation, she has obsessive compulsive disorder and um, she has a lot of fears around things that could happen. So Honestly, we just ordered her some things for her backpack that made her feel better. She had a first aid kit. She had a mask. I mean, this is before COVID. She had a mask that she could put on. She had um, one of those foil things you put over in case you got cold. She had some snacks. And that just made her feel better around being prepared. And I don't honestly know if it would have done anything in any type of crisis, but she was fully prepared for events. And she would think through what events could occur and then Sometimes we put that on her list for Christmas or whatever. So she ended up having a survival bag inside her backpack, but that made her feel better. Mm -hmm. So for a kid who is anxious, um, if that's what they need to do, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like she pulled it all out and showed it to somebody at school, but she knew it was in there and she would restock. And if somebody needed a Band-Aid, she always had one for them. So um, for that piece, you know, let them have what they need to feel more comfortable because that made her feel better. Um, so... The second part of that question, you said, um, if you have concerns about that, before, um, and you've heard this over and over, if you see something, say something. That's the most important thing that you can tell any anybody in a school building. If it feels wrong or you see something online and you're like, I wonder if that is, 
well, don't wonder, go tell the trusted adult. It could be a parent. It could be somebody at your school. But if you see something that makes you uncomfortable, it's making you uncomfortable for a reason. And it's that gut feeling you have that it's like, oh, this just doesn't set right with me. Um, so if you see um, a student at school maybe drawing pictures of something or um, they you overhear a comment in the hallway because kids talk in the hallway, but they don't think anyone else can hear, hear them for some reason. <laughs> or when they come into class, they sit and talk and they think we can't hear them. That's where most of the information comes out or when somebody reports something. So if you see something, say something is a really important um, motto to teach your child. And also too, if they have a friend who's struggling, um, many times they'll, a student will come in and say, I feel so bad to tell this because she told me that in confidence. But I always say you're saving lives by doing this. Mm -hmm. That's how important it is. You are saving lives today by telling someone this and make them understand that that's what's on the line. It truly is life and death when they come in and report a friend who's not doing well or who may have made some comments. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we've talked about that fear, right? When we have that fear that maybe our teen is going to experience something or is experiencing some sort of violence at school. Um, and as parents, we think that it could never be our child, right, that's going to commit some act of violence, um, but it does happen. And so what might indicate that a student is planning something or that maybe your teen is planning something? What are some things that caregivers could look out for? Yeah, I know that's hard to think about, but everything that has, every incident that has happened, that's someone's child who did that. So I always think about the parent piece of it when, um, events occur, like how are the parents managing this right now? Because how horrific is that? So um, for the parent to be proactive and looking for things um, and things we look for at school as well, which is what we teach teachers to look for, like uh, when they're doing artwork, are they drawing things that are violent, particularly um, younger children who are doing very violent drawings? Um, that's a huge red flag because at that age, developmentally, that probably shouldn't be something that would be on their radar. Um, and even as teens, looking at artwork, looking at song lyrics or poetry, sometimes the um, way that comes through uh, in journal writing, they'll write something in a class. This happens a lot. And a teacher will see something that looks in, I don't, they report it because like, oh no, why is, why is the child writing this in their journal or why are they writing it in a poetry form? Again, if they're writing it at school, it seems to me like they're asking for help because they're putting it out there and they know a teacher is going to see that. For the parent, um, I think really online engagement is huge because the thing I think really interesting about what's currently going on, we really protect our kids from outside forces, right? Like, you know, don't go with anyone uh, who looks suspicious. We give them all this training and then we put them in their room with this thing that has access to everything in the whole world on their iPhone. And the communications that they can have on there are way more dangerous than somebody who might approach them on the street, which mm -hmm. is fairly rare. But their online activity is like the greatest indicator um, for something. And I know there's a lot of parents who say, my teen needs their privacy. I shouldn't um, interfere with that. But my, my premise is if I'm paying for this phone and you're living in this house that I am paying for, then um, I have the right to look at what you're doing. So when my daughter was going through things, I would occasionally ask for her phone. And, you know, I didn't give her any warning. I would just say, hey, um, let me have your phone and I would go through it. And she knew that was part of, you know, part of our deal that mm -hmm. this is what the expectation is. So when your teens like, this is mine, I'm, you know, it's not fair, you're looking at this. Uh, I think it's, terrifying what all is out there in the world and people that they could be talking to who are catfishing or pretending to be someone else or online groups they could be participating in that um, maybe bringing out that violent side of them, especially uh, with all that's out there right now. So I think that's the most important thing is to look at online engagement. Um, and if your child is disengaging from friends that they've had for a long time, if they are in their room all the time with the door closed, they uh, aren't participating in family events and they've shut down. That's really a huge concern, whether for mental health or maybe they're getting involved in things online that they shouldn't be. So um, just 
notice your child's sleeping patterns? Um, do they not care about their appearance any longer? Has their eating pattern changed where they're eating more or not eating at all? Those are indicators of something more going on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Sarah, so I don't mean to interrupt. This is mm -hmm. Grace Alger here. Question, a couple questions that um, have come up is, you know, going back to those drills, especially in the beginning of the school year, when um, you, you know, those drills are important and they're proactive. Um, but when you have um, a child that is extremely anxious or has sensory overload, um, and a parent is really, really anxious about that sensory overload and really anxious about those drills, um, how honest, one of the questions is coming up that how honest should be, should the parent be with the child about their own anxiety, whether it's on the drills or just school violence in general, um, does that um, make the child feel more comfortable that their parent has some anxieties over it and then statement? Or is it harder for you to tell your child, I'm feeling anxious about this? Um, so there's kind of a two part question. It's, okay. it's I'm feeling anxious about that, but also the parent who is really more anxious about their child that has sensory overload, right? And you're right. doing these drills and um, how that parent maybe in the summer before school starts can say, these unexpected things are going to happen, but they are building you up. Like what are, what are some of those parenting things now that as kids are going back to school that they can empower their children with, especially those that are super anxious or have some sensory overload problems. Right. So I would say a different category would be um, children with autism. Um, that is a different category because I think that is important when they hear that loud bell ringing or the drill occurring. Um, we do work with those students, particularly with the teacher in the classroom to let them know a drill is about to occur so they can give the students a heads up because um, that is a, a real concern for our students with autism. For sensory overload, um, it's not uh, so much that we would let the teacher know, but I would think it was important for the parent to let the counselor know that they are concerned about it so that the counselor is aware. Uh, one thing a parent could do, and I think honesty and transparency are a big part of parenting, and it's fine to say, you know, I have some concerns about this, and I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. How do you feel about it? So. Um, letting them know that you're a little bit concerned too, so you want to have a conversation, normalizes it for the student if they're anxious as well, but involving your school counselor is huge for that, so letting the school counselor know that the student may have some concerns, and then after the drill, many times the counselor can go check on the student or tell the, your child, if you are having concerns after the drill, go find your counselor and have a conversation about that, so if you give them a heads up, the counselor, that's why they're there for those kinds of concerns. So um, they're more than happy to step in and assist with that. And again, that's something we do every day is uh, work with parents and students in that area. Did that fully answer it, Grace? Yes, it does. I think anytime that we as parents can have something proactively kind of in our own backpack to pull out or our toolbox to pull out that says, okay, we know that our child um, does not like the loud noise of the fire drill or when they hear intruder drill, their mind might go to another place. It's, it is important for us to tell the counselors ahead of time so that they can check in with that child afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then right. as a parent, you can feel a little bit more relaxed on how your child is processing that proactive behavior to be safe. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really important thing that maybe parents can even just feel for themselves, right? They can feel like a little bit more in control and empowered as right. well because they've done some steps ahead of time. Right, and I will just add another layer to this. Um, the schools are really clamping down uh, cell phones because we've had such an issue overall with students' well-being and mental health because they're constantly on their phones and even to disengage in their, from their phone in class has been difficult for them. So for parents, I, mean, I always joke about, I could go somewhere, my parents would have no idea where I was so I should back up at 11 o'clock at night. Or I would, when I was in college, I called home once a week on Sunday afternoon when the long distance rates were down. But we are so used to that instant gratification of hearing from our child. And if they don't respond, 
but then two seconds, anyway, we don't see the bubbles, we panic, we keep texting, but um, with schools clamping down on that, parents also have to be okay with that to say, I can't be in constant contact with my child all day. All day. They, I just got an email that had a drill and I need to text and make sure they're okay, but you know, they may not have their phone right there um, during instruction. So again, having the school counselor um, handy or the counselor can check and the child knows to go to that counselor um, helps alleviate some of the parents' um, anxiety around that. Mm -hmm. So I wanna go back to the other part of that question. I know we've talked a little bit about transparency. Do you think that it's more beneficial for parents to be transparent when they're also feeling that anxiety? Um, or do you think that could add to the students? Yeah. It's a fine line because you don't want to project your own anxiety, your own anxiety onto the child because that's easily done. Um, because, well, my daughter said to me one time, mom, you're escalating me. <laughs> that's when I realized I was projecting mm -hmm. my stuff onto her. And she was doing fine, but I kept talking about the situation and I was worried about it. And then I was escalating her because she didn't realize that she should be concerned about it. So that's a, a fine line of projecting your own anxiety to your child and or saying, you know, I'm feeling um, a little anxious about this. So let's have a conversation because I want to see if you're anxious too. Mm -hmm. So that's not projecting. That's having a being transparent and then opening the conversation. But if you're constantly bringing it up and checking and doing that, then you're escalating the situation and projecting your anxiety onto them. Right. And no longer helpful for them. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm sorry so, about this, Claire, but the sun is coming right in my windows. Oh, no. <laughs> to move. You are go. totally fine. So, um, a parenting question that has come up is um, how much should we let our kids watch and listen to the news when a school shooting or some sort of violence has happened in a school environment, um, knowing that at different ages, you know, we know elementary, middle, high, college, all of that, they have different processing abilities. Um, so a question is, is how much should we let them know about the news or watch the news or talk about the news that's happening around us as parents? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I don't enjoy watching the news at all. I try to stay off of, um, a lot of the social media sites that when things are happening and I watch like the headline news, but as an adult, it's been a lot for me to even watch that. So for a child to watch it, I would, you know, try to keep them away from that as much as possible. Not be like, oh no, don't watch the news because then they're going to be more drawn to it. But um, having a conversation about it. if there is a school shooting, they may hear about it at school or someone else is talking about it. So have the conversation. Um, with your student, and if they want to watch the news, sit down with them and watch it and talk through it with them. Because if you make it taboo, um, it makes it even worse for them. That they will then want to watch it, they may sneak and watch it on their own and then aren't able to process. But if they do ask about it, do it together and then process it with them and have that conversation as it's occurring. Mm -hmm. And again, for teenagers, they don't watch the news, they get everything on their phone. So it's probably, giving them notifications as things are occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've talked about having those conversations. Um, and I know you said, you know, you worked with your daughter to get kind of a, a preparedness pack together for her. What, and she whatever. gave me permission to tell that. <laughs> okay. I asked her permission to just tell oh. it to everybody. <laughs> tell her thank you from us. Yes. Um, what are some other things, maybe like action plans um, or things that parents can do, you know, teens are seeing the news, right? They're hearing about the events that are occurring. Um, so different things that they can do, um, you know, we have those conversations, but are there actual, you know, actions that they can take to help those anxious feelings? Hmm. Again, that all depends on the child and their level of anxiety. Um, I think if your child is transitioning to a new grade level, like sixth or ninth grade, and they've never been in that building before, it's really important to go to the school ahead of time and walk through it. And even uh, before back to school night, the schools are open right now. So you can walk into a building and get your child acclimated to the building. Let them see where the school counselor's office is. Let them see where the nurse's office is. So if they do feel anxious, they have somewhere to go. I think that's the most difficult thing for transition ages because you're new in that building and you have no idea where to go if something happens and you're nervous at the beginning of school. So having a plan in place, um, you know, if you are feeling anxious, you can go see the counselor or the nurse uh, pretty immediately. 
and um, your teacher will let you go do that if you're if you're having a concern. Most of our schools also have calming rooms or calming spaces, um, or in elementary they have calm calming corners. So if you start to feel anxious, talk to your child about that. Um, we all have what are coping me mechanisms that we work through, and working through coping mechanisms with your child, if they learn how to do the deep breathing or um, doing a five, four, three, two, one, if they start getting anxious, whatever that looks like, if it's coloring, if it's listening to music, all of those things are in a calming space in the, in the buildings or in a room. So um, they can ask to go to the calming space. You get 10 minutes of time in there. If you still escalate after that, a counselor, they're monitored, a counselor will come and talk to you, but you might just need to go to that calming space and settle down a little bit. So talk to your child about what is it that makes them feel better, uh, you know, playing a little game. We have Buddha boards. We have um, all kinds of stuff in there. Um, but that's another good resource that they can do instead of just being anxious and sitting in their desk and not able to think about math. It's really hard to think about math when you're anxious, but can you step away for a moment, go to the calming space, and then come back and be ready to do math again? We also do what are called walk and talks with students who are anxious. So if they go to see the counselor, we'll just walk around the building and do some calming things while we're walking. So a 10 minute little walk with the counselor and then you can come back to class, but they don't need to sit there and be anxious. So prepare them for those kinds of things. Here are some people you can go talk to. Here are some things that you can do at school. And I don't know that there's much stigma attached to this anymore. Uh, mental health needs are so huge right now. Um, there's no stigma at all to go to the calming room. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It used to be stigma attached to that, but I don't really see that anymore. Well, that's awesome. Um, that's what we work for, right? To, right. To <laughs> stigma. Um, so I think it's great that you guys have all of those options and those outlets, um, not only for the students, but for the parents as well. And they can also have things, like I said, in the preparedness backpack, things mm -hmm. in their backpack that make them feel calmer, you know, whether it be rubbing on um, a soft material, or whatever they use to calm down they can keep that in their backpack as well and use that when they start to feel anxious and it makes them feel like a part of home is with them mm -hmm. yeah finding what works for them um, so again you know we've talked about how we don't want to say oh this will never happen right because it does um, so when a school um, an incidence of school violence has happened what can parents expect from schools on how they're going to talk about it to the community and how they're going to handle it um, in those first days following the event? Um, how right. can so, parents be caught up on that? That's uh, something you never want to have to work through, right? Um, we learn from other schools who have gone through it. So you put plans in place. Um, fortunately, we have not had a school shooting in my school division. I don't want to say that out loud because it could be tomorrow when we do. I do remember um, if, if y'all been in the area for a while, when I first came to Hanover, uh, we had the sniper, um, the DC sniper who came to Hanover County and he was doing shootings up and down um, 95 and he got off the exit in Ashland and shot someone and then he posted on the tree, your children are not safe. So, you know, working through that with kids was a pretty intensive ordeal because it was frightening. And we were frightened as adults to go outside because he had been in our community and he had threatened us. But again, having the conversations with the students, we bring extra support and extra staff on site um, to work with families. So if your child is feeling anxious, we always have a crew on site, no matter if there's anything that happens, a student death, a, a, a teacher passes away, we bring resources in. So your school, I think, is your best resource because we're there and we're available. And like, maybe you're not able to access a therapist immediately, but the school counselor is always there. We have social workers, school psychologists. We have a plethora of people there who can help you. So um, if you do have an event in your building, we try to communicate as quickly as possible. We have amazing partnerships with the sheriff's office, with the schools. We have... Uh, I don't even, I can't even articulate how diligently we work to put everything into place because we do drills with the sheriff's office as well. We have all these things in place um, if things do occur. So the parent just needs to reach out. We try to communicate as quickly as possible and then talking to your child about acclimating back to the building. A lot of times when these things occur, uh, they don't come back into that school building that school year. 
but mm -hmm. that just depends on the situation. Absolutely. No, I think again, it's so I can't talk much to that, Sarah, because I personally had not had to live through that. I have been to uh, conferences and workshops for counselors who have lived through it, but I have not personally had to live through that. So, well, Carla, um, I think one of the questions that has come up is um, if you have not luckily had to live through that, but your child has heard about that on the news. Um, and this it's the talk of the hallways, right? Um, and so if there is a language that the parents can use at home that the school is using, I think consistent language is always key. Um, if there's a language in a, um, you know, three word sentence or three sentences that reassure kids, um, what, what would that look like? Because I, I think it's important for parents to mirror and work together with the schools. So if, you know, our ch children walk into a school after something that is horrific happened in the news and all the hallway talk is happening, what are some of the things that you um, kind of teach your and train your counselors and your teachers to say, you know, those couple of words that just give a little bit of reassurance that the parents mm -hmm. could also use at home. Mm -hmm. So it's, we can't stop what happens in the hall. And we try to talk in the classrooms and we talk to groups of kids, but I think the hallway talk, Grace, is the most frightening part because that's where, in the, and then the lunchroom area, because they're not monitored as closely. So that's where more conversations occur. But um, having the conversations to say, if you are uncomfortable, and again, saying this over and over, please go talk to a trusted adult if you are uncomfortable or if you hear something that makes you uncomfortable. If that talk in the hallway is making you feel frightened or um, tense or stressed out, go talk to your trusted adult, or maybe they even have a trusted friend in the building. Go find that safe person. And we that's, I think, the message we send most. You have a safe person and you have a trusted adult. And those are your, your people at school. That's what makes you okay to be there. Um, for those students who uh, don't have that, um, as school counselors, we try to have those conversations at the beginning of the school year. We ask every student, do you have a trusted adult in the building? And those are the students we look out for more because if you don't have a trusted adult, who are you going to go to? So again, we can't say this won't ever happen here, but we do say you have a trusted adult, you have um, a safe friend, you have a safe space to come to. That's the messaging that we give out because the hallway doesn't feel safe, but you can come up to the counseling office or go to the calming space or find your trusted adult. So find somebody, do something for yourself instead of escalating and being stressed on your own. I think that's a great point, Carla, because I think for, and you touched on this earlier, focusing on what um, what you can do. And so when you're worried, whether it's about school violence or anything, um, what are the things that you do when you're worried, right? And so um, I think focusing, you know, we have to acknowledge that violence is out there and these things are happening. And then maybe caregivers can switch the conversation to, well, what, what can you do within yourself to feel more grounded? Right. And, and that's what we talk about on that but the coping mechanisms what are your coping mechanisms what do you do when you start to feel stressed when you start to feel anxious here are things that work for you and we just teach those over and over and as a parent working with a child you do the same thing and what is it that makes you feel better we're listening to music um, my daughter has a, a certain song when she gets anxious um it's uh, ann murray's you needed me i don't know why <laughs> How does she even know who Anne Murray is? But that's the song she puts on whenever she's stressed. And that's how I know if that song is blasting up in her room, you know, I know that she's using that to calm down. So whatever that looks like for your child um, and making sure you have that conversation with them about what that is. And the counselor can also have the conversation, like what is your coping skill? And the parent could share that with the counselor. This is what my child does when they need to deescalate. So um having lots of conversations about how do you manage your own stress and how do you manage your anxiety? And here's, here's your, your toolkit to do that. It's okay to have a toolkit to do it. Mm -hmm. And it could be internally or it could be things you carry in your backpack. Mm -hmm. When you've talked about, you know, the counselor or psychologist, and I think it's important because that trusted adult might not always be the parent, right? It might be a friend's parent, it might be a coach. And so I think it's important that as caregivers, 
you know, we go to the schools and we know who is involved there and we know who our child, our teen has to go to in the school so that we're familiar and that, you know, everybody can work together to support those teens. Right. And I think what you said, Sarah, is important. The parent is not always the trusted adult, but we encourage the child to have who's your trusted adult at school and who's your trusted adult in the community. And sometimes they may name an aunt or a youth minister at church, or they may name, um, you know, like you said, a friend's parent. It may not always be the parent, even as hard as that is to hear as the parent. You know, they may be, maybe you're not the trusted adult, but if they have one and someone to talk to, and I always say, talk to your trusted adult and then help, have them help you, help you talk to your parent. We always bring it back around to the parents. Absolutely. And I guess the main thing is, is don't avoid it. Don't mm -hmm. avoid the conversation, have a plan. So if you start to feel anxious, what can you do? What are some things you're going to do if this happens? So talk through that, don't, as Grace said, don't just give into it, but talk to them about having a plan in place. If you start to get anxious, so this happens, what will you do mm -hmm. in this situation? Um, so I know we've talked a lot about the proactive measures, um, and we talked a little bit about the concern that it might be our child, right, that might be planning something or involved in something. Um, and, you know, we talked about the phones and the social media. So if that were to happen, right, you find out that your teen is doing something online um, and, you know, you take their phone and that kind of, they just shut down and that's not a solution. What could a parent do if they are concerned about that? What resources are available to them? Well, you know, I have a degree in this. <laughs> I struggle as a parent to find resources for my child. So I always think about that for parents. If you don't work in this field and don't have knowledge about it, how difficult that is to navigate. Um, because I, having a degree in it and doing it for my job, struggled through that with my own child. So if you find something that frightens you and the child is not talking to you about it and is shutting down, um, again, the first place to go is to your school counselor to have that conversation because they prop, they may have seen something at school or a teacher may have reported something. Again, that's a great partnership to have. Um, also, and I, I hate to say this for right now because it's so hard to get into for mental health right now. If you are really worried about your child and you're afraid they're gonna do something to themselves or someone else, take them to the emergency room. That is the best way to get in anywhere because they do an assessment there and not maybe to Memorial Regional because they are they don't have access. Take your child to VCU's emergency room because they have a partnership with Virginia Treatment Center or taking them to Chip, Chippenham because they have Tucker Pavilion. If you go to Memorial Regional, they don't have a partnership with anywhere. So you have to wait till a bed opens up. It could be anywhere in the state. So trying to go to those emergency rooms where you can get um, access to treatment more closely but if you are worried, they can do an assessment there. If they sense that there is a concern, um, they can work with you. And unfortunately, you might have to sit in the emergency room for a little while right now because mental health has escalated so much over the past couple of years. Um, if you don't feel like it's a crisis mode and you need to look for a therapist, um, another option is to go to your community services board and they do same day access service every day from eight to two. And that's a state requirement. Everybody, every CSB and the state does that. So you can do walk-in, they can do an assessment on your child and then they can help hook you up with resources. So you're not on your own with that. Even if you have insurance, you can go to um, CSB and they can help you with that. If you are looking for a therapist, uh, we use this uh, site, it's called psychologytoday.com. And you go in there and you type in your um, zip code, the type of insurance that you have, and then what the presenting concern is. You can filter for the age of the therapist, the gender of the therapist, just to find a good fit for your child. Uh, do want to say that you need to look for a specific disorder because one size does not fit all. You know, if you can't just say, here's, here's a therapist, I'm bringing my child in. So therapists specialize in different things. So for an example, with OCD, my daughter needed to do cognitive behavioral therapy. And I really wanted to find somebody who would do exposure therapy with her because that's the best treatment for OCD. We ended up finding a VCU's anxiety clinic and they do exposure therapy. So we were able to get her in there. Again, I found that by doing psychology today and I typed in 
exposure therapies and it brought up everybody in the area who does exposure therapy. So I just started making phone calls, trying to get into a therapist. Um, the therapist may not work out the first one. We, I think we've probably been through four therapists till we land on one that was amazing. And she's been a guest on here. Ashley Morgan Sukup is mm -hmm. an amazing therapist. So we've been with her for about three years now. So, you know, you may have to go through a few therapists to get there, but if you do have concerns and as a parent, you don't know how to handle it, go get help. That's what all this is here for. So partner with your school, you have your community services board, you have an emergency room if you feel like this is imminent and you also could uh, find a therapist in the area. Absolutely. Um, and I love that you mentioned, you know, it's not one size fits all um, because. Oh, I do want to mention one other for you all. <laughs> uh, we also refer all the time to our Virginia Treatment uh, Parent Resource Center mm -hmm. that the Cameron Gallagher Foundation placed there. Um, I went through that as a parent as well before you all built this beautiful new one mm -hmm. at the Virginia Treatment Center for Children. We refer parents there all the time. They give you a family navigator to help you find resources so you're not on your own. So that's one I forgot to mention, but I refer to that one all the time. Oh, the, that's right, Sarah, right. Sarah, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I want you to head there, Sarah, but I wanted to um, just quickly have Carla and her expert opinion talk a little bit about when we talk about school violence, you know, a lot of times when we talk about trauma, um, we think trauma is looks a certain way. And I think trauma for our children, they're sponges, their brains are sponges and they're absorbing so much around them. And so whether it's um, a school shooting that's a couple states away or um, uh, the, you know, a bomb threat at a local school that ended up being nothing, um, that was a practical joke or anything like that, that trauma is really defined as something that was completely unexpected that hits you in the face. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a layman's way of looking at it. Um, and so in your, you know, everything that you know, and all of your expert opinion, when, when we talk about trauma, how can you talk to caregivers right now about trauma is actually happening in our children's lives? And sometimes, and this is part about conversations with CKG, we say things that maybe people don't want to say, but really trauma is all around us. And if we hide from it, then we, um, then we're not going to do we're not gonna be able to navigate through it. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about how the effects of trauma of hearing about these school shootings around you and, um, and not marinating in the negative, but when trauma happens and your kids' brains are processing this, what can caregivers do in the aftermath of whether our, their kids heard about it on the news, whether they were really involved in listening or they're hearing it about in the hallways, trauma has happened to their brain. They're processing the way their brain actually process. What are some care like tips for caregivers in that like first aftermath of it, of an unfortunate violence? Um, the I think what you said is really important, Grace, about trauma because I think sometimes we think of trauma as big things like a death in the family or an assault of some sort, but trauma comes in many shapes and forms. Um, so recognizing trauma, I mentioned some signs earlier that a child might be suffering. They may not come to you with that, but if they're disengaging, their grades are dropping, something is going on with them. Um, the way I was raised is we didn't talk about it. We're like, is everything okay? Yes. Okay, good. And then we don't bring it up again. It was just all swept under the rug. That was the Southern genteel way <laughs> processing trauma, but we know that does not work. So, um, Having that conversation, do not negate the fear. So if a child has a fear over something that even seems minimal, that it, but it's something that's percolating in their brain, that can be traumatizing for them. So don't negate the fear by saying, oh, you don't need to be worried about that. That's never going to happen to you. Um, you never should have to worry about uh, a tsunami coming here <laughs> because they might've seen on the news a tsunami hit. So they're worried about that. And they saw everything being swept away. So don't negate it by saying that could never happen, but talk about um, we're here right now. This is your safe space. What can we do to help you feel better, better about that? And then just having the conversation, like I said earlier, and then bringing it up again later, as I said, with the scaling question, where do you feel right now? Are you an A, B, C, D or an F right now? 
And then let's talk again. If you're still C right now, we'll talk again in a little while and I'm gonna check back in with you. It doesn't have to be a conversation that goes on for two hours, but that you're circling back around and having the conversation again, checking in in a couple of days, um, and not just thinking this conversation is one and done and it's going to go away because if it's uh, in their minds a lot and you're not continuing and circling back around to it, again, it's just going to fester and come back up again. So bringing it up often, but again, not to escalate it, but just to check back in. How are you feeling about that? Are you doing better today? Is there anything you want to talk about that? Um, um, or is there anything I can help you with to talk about that? Do you want me to sit with you right now? Do you want me to sit here with you and just listen to this song? And um, can I hold your hand while we do it? Just asking things like that, because mm -hmm. that presence and um, sometimes just being there with them or a soft touch or not, always ask permission. That, may I do this right now? May I sit here with you? Would that help you feel better? Sometimes they don't want you to, but you know, just asking the child what they need and what can I do for you right now? Mm -hmm. Um, well, that answered my next question a little bit. You know, we've talked so much about having the conversation and I love the grading scale that you use with the letters. Um, but what what can you do when you're trying to have that conversation and your teen is not giving you anything? You know, you are getting those short one word answers and you're not really able to get anything out of them. What might you recommend to help them open up, to help them feel more comfortable? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, it takes, sometimes it just takes consistency and continuing to be there for them and saying, I know you don't wanna talk right now, but I'm here for you when you're ready. Um, and I'm gonna to continue to check on you because I'm your mom and I love you and I'm worried about you right now. So I'm just gonna let you sit here for a little bit, but I'm gonna come back in again in a little while and we're going to have a conversation. So many times, and I don't know, I just see this a lot in teen movies and the way teens are portrayed is that, oh, they don't want to talk, they're going to shut down. But I find a lot of kids who are going through things really do want to share it. If you just try once and then they are they snap at you and are ugly and you say, okay, fine, let's not talk about it. You just missed a golden opportunity because they want you to talk to them about it. They're struggling, they're, they're kids, they're scared. So, uh, you know, don't shut them down because they shut you down. You keep coming back. You show love. I understand that you don't want to talk right now. And I, I get, I see that you're upset with me, but I love you and I'm going to be here for you. And um, I'm going to come back here in a little bit and we're going to talk. So uh, be there for them, even if they don't want you in the moment, because inside, I believe they really do want you. It's just that uh, facade they put up because they're a teenager. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that comes back to, you know, finding what works for you, what phrases work and. Um, right. And what is your, what, you know, what does your kid enjoy? What do they like to do? As I said, find an activity that they like to do. If they like to play a video game, try to play a video game with them because they mm -hmm. might come up with a conversation on why you're doing that. Um, my kids played, my son played with toys that I had no idea what we were doing, Transformers. And I would sit down on the floor and do Transformers and he would like tell me all this stuff. So you know, just doing activities with them that they like. Uh, sometimes will spark conversations too. Yeah, making that connection, definitely. Um, all right, well, we have got about 10 minutes left. Um, I know that we've answered quite a few questions. Um, Grace, have we addressed all of the Q and A's? I think oh, I did wanna give one more resource. Um, at the Sandy Hook Promise is a great site for um, parents to use too for uh, resources for kids. It has videos. It has all kinds of things on how to have, have conversations with your children. So that's another really good resource that I uh, forgot to mention. It's called the Sandy Hook Promise, and it's put together by um, the survivors and then many, many people who um, were at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Well, Carl, I'm so glad that you mentioned that resource because I think um, a lot of times storytelling is some of your um, best resources. And to be able to um, really connect with a resource that someone went through an environment that was horrific and um, to not only learn the proactive measures from preventing the actual violence, but the resilience that can be built um, in our children. And um, I think resilience is a big thing that we can give our children when they are watching the news and they're worried and they're trying to um, process this world, which we can't stop from spinning and all the things that happen in it. 
And I, and I, I love everything you have said about, you know, focusing on what you can control and acknowledging what is real, but also acknowledging that the, the good that's in the world, right? There's, there is good there too. And I think sometimes um, we don't always, we talk about their worries and how to handle their worries. And, you know, we, we have to, we can't hide from the truth, but at the same time, we can give them little anchors to hold on to of in your world, you know, Jane Doe, this is what's good in your world. And it may only be something very simple, but something that they can hold on to as an anchor. And that that anchor can be really powerful during a drill. It can be really powerful during, um, you know, a nighttime head spinning session because you listen to the news of something violent that happened. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really important um, and one of the things we're doing here tonight is to just have this conversation and to also say, we don't have all the answers, right? You cannot predict. We don't have the, um, the, you know, the magic ball that tells us what we can, you know, look out for and everything. And we're going to be, you know, blindsided and we're going to be shocked and we're going to be heartbroken. But the more we um, build those trusted adults, the more we build our community of um, who do you go to when you're scared? Um, and, and the more we do that, the more as these worries come into our children's lives because of what's happening in the world, the better they're equipped to navigate through it. And I think that is a key that um, I would love just in this last couple minutes for you to speak to a little bit on, you know, we can't all, we talk a lot about, we can't always control what happens, but we have a choice on how we navigate through it. Right. Um, so if you have any great, um, any tidbits for caregivers on how they can model that behavior, because as much as we think our kids are in, ignoring us, they kind of aren't. Right, I'll actually have, um, right beside my desk, um, things that are in my control and things that are out of my control. So majority of things are out of my control, but there are those things and there, you can find these online, just type in things in my control and things out of my control and there'll be a little graphic that'll pop up. But we provide this in all of our counseling offices and we talk to kids about that, like what can you control, how you respond to it, um, how you feel about it, if you process it with someone, you can control those things. The things out of your control are, are overwhelming and that's the majority of that, but you can control how you respond to that. So having that conversation, like what can you do in the moment to be proactive? This could happen, but what can you control in the situation? Uh, one of the resources, uh, hopping back to this again, but if you have a child who is in the LGBTQ plus community, those fears are also can be very different and you see violence towards LGBTQ communities. Another great resource is the Trevor Project. So highly recommend going onto that site if you have a, a student who falls into the LGBTQ plus community. Did not want to leave that one off either. But uh, talking to your kids about um, what can they do to manage? What does that look like at school? Um, when things happen, if you're away from me, if uh, the parent is the trusted space, what if you're not with me? What does that look like? What would you do there? And I just remember, uh, I just remembered this while we were talking, I would kiss my daughter's um, hand before she left when she was nervous. And I would say during the day, if you just put your um, hand on your face, that's me giving you a kiss on your cheek if that would make you feel better. So we did that for a while and she was really anxious. So little things like that, that help them to comfort themselves, to self-soothe. We start that when they're babies, right? So there are ways you can self-soothe. We call them now coping mechanisms, but um, just talking to them about what that looks like and what does that feel like? And what does that do for you when you're not at home and when you're out in maybe a situation that you're nervous or scared? So the last thing I want to ask you, um, Carla, is um, so we have the teachers, you know, kind of the frontline workers in this environment of um, when school violence happens. If you had advice to give to the teachers in um, a classroom where um, it ne didn't necessarily happen in their community, but kids are coming in and they're hearing them talk about it. Um, what, what would be advice for teachers that you would give to them to say, um, to help de-escalate? You know, how do you de-escalate de those? I, I'm a firm believer in if you are self-aware and you know where it feels in your body first, then you can move on from there. Mm -hmm. That's me, but that's not everybody. So 
how would a teacher speak to a classroom full of students that said that just heard something horrible on the news and it could be several states away mm -hmm. yeah that's a harder one i think because teachers are on the front line as you said and they're with those kids every day where um whereas the counselor doesn't see see them as often so we try to work with the teachers to and workshops and things like that you know that's what i'm doing all next week our back to school events for teachers um, helping them to navigate what goes on in the classrooms because again they're the ones in the building who see everything who hear everything and then let us know if things aren't going well um, so giving students somewhat space to talk but again you don't want to get the room all fired up if a couple of kids are upset if that were the case i would maybe call the counselor down or have the kids go see the counselor because you don't want to get the whole room of kids upset if not everyone is having that conversation i think just uh, being aware of what's going on in the room. Um, I don't know that I would agree a whole classroom talking about something because again, it doesn't impact everybody in the same way. But just being cognizant of those kids who seem extra anxious or a little bit teary, um, you know, taking them aside or um, having the school counselor meet with them. I don't know that I would want a teacher navigating a big conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think that's, you know, that goes back to those, the trusted adults as well and making sure you've got multiple of those available to you, hopefully. Um, so we've talked about that as a resource, you know, in and of itself. Teens have um, multiple resources available to them just within their schools. Um, you know, we want to take those proactive approaches, but when those aren't working or when we need something further, um, we've talked about a lot of different community resources as well. Um, so I will send those out um, to everyone attending. You'll get an email with the recording and with all of those resources. Um, so if you didn't get them all in the moment, um, we'll make sure that everyone gets a copy of those. Um, any other questions or Carla, anything in particular that you wanted to touch on before we close out? And uh, this is hard work, y'all. Um, ask for help. There's lots of resources out there. We um, we're all in it together trying to do what's best for our kids. So you're not alone out there. Um, partner with your school counselors, with your teachers, with you know your neighbors, whatever we need to do to keep our kids safe. And also as a parent to keep yourself in a good space, um, making sure you're taking care of your own wellness so that you can help your children. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carla, for being with us this evening. Thank you for what you do um, in the community and at the schools. Um, and thank you, Grace, for your help tonight. Thank you for everyone who has attended. Um, again, we'll be sending out an email with a link to um, a recording of tonight's conversation and then all of those resources that we talked about um, and then a couple more as well, just so that everyone has those available to them. Um, but thank you all for being with us this evening um, and keep an eye out for our next conversations coming in November. Thank you. Have a great evening.